Hi, I'm Mike Gerhauser. On behalf of the other elders and all who gather here, I want to say welcome to Resurgence Church. We are glad that you found us. Now, whether this is your first time joining us or you meet with us regularly, we pray that the message that you're about to hear would encourage you, would edify you in your faith, and would bring glory to God. We also want to encourage you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Don't forget to hit that bell so that you get notifications. And if you want to learn any more about us, you can go to our website at rsgchurch.com. There you can listen to past messages, you can give online, you can check our calendar of events, and you can see our statement of faith. Thank you again for joining us. Pray that you are blessed by the preaching of the word this morning. God bless you. Excited today to, to have um, Will Brooks come and share the word with you all this morning. I know you've probably seen him around. Uh, he's been coming to the men's group for a long, long time, and, and him and his wife, Alana, and their new baby, Maisie, have been coming for a while to the church. Uh, but Will, if you don't know, Will was a youth and young adult pastor for, for many, many years um, and was on the regular preaching uh, rotation at New Life Community Church in Sayville when they moved back further east here. Um, it was a bit of a commute, so we are blessed to have them with us here and uh, blessed with, with Will's teaching. He taught once before, and I was, I was really blessed by it. So would you welcome Will Brooks? He's going to share the word with you this morning. Thank you, Mike. So I see how it is that all the people sit in the front, and then as soon as you get up here to preach, they leave. Well, except for you three, thank you. Um, so first of all, I have to point it out, Carl said, Will, that's a really nice graphic. And I said, Carl, you want to know how I made that? AI. I just asked it to make a Greek backdrop of a field. with. So you can do cool things today with technology. But um, I'm really excited to, to bring the word to you today. Um, and I kind of, as I was working on this sermon and talking to Mike about, Pastor Mike, of where we are in the Ephesians series, I, I realized um, we're at that awkward slaves and masters text from Ephesians. And now you're thinking, the last time Will got up here, he talked about Song of Solomon. Now we're talking about slaves and masters, and I see how it is. I just get the, the tough texts to preach, um, clearly. But, but you know, and you, Pastor Mike gave me an out. He's like, well, you don't have to preach that. You preach whatever you want. But here's the, here's the reality. When we dive into God's word, Right, God's word, it says in Isaiah, it says, uh, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Every bit of it, all scripture is good for teaching, correction, growth, all those things. So there are parts of scripture that are a little awkward for us to look at and we say, oh, this is uncomfortable. I don't want to talk about that. A lot of churches will skip over it entirely. They just won't preach on texts like this. Um, so not to get overly nerdy, we need to power through, um, but these uncomfortable bits of scripture are really only uncomfortable, I think, when we don't have the confidence of how to talk about them biblically. See, we look at them from the lens of our own experiences or maybe our own historical understanding of things. And just again, to get a little nerdy, this is called eisegesis, if you haven't heard of this phrase before. And eisegesis is biblical interpretation when you take your own experiences and the way you understand the world, your own presuppositions, and you read that onto the text. So when we see something like slavery, where do our minds go? American slavery, oh, rightfully so. It was evil, it was bad. And immediately we go, I don't want to touch this subject because that's really uncomfortable and I don't want to even think about that. Um, but when we read text and the proper way to read scripture is in context, and this is called the practice of exegesis. So eisegesis is reading ourselves into scripture. Exegesis is saying, what was the culture like then? What is Paul instructing the culture to do then? What is my takeaway? How do I understand that and apply that to my life today? And slavery is a weird one because we don't practice slavery in our culture today. Again, praise the Lord. It was bad. Um, but at the same time, it can, we, we have to look at it in the context of Roman slavery, how that was practiced, what Paul is saying about it, how he's instructing the household in general within the Christian context to behave in light of slavery, and then take, bring our takeaways from there. Um, eisegesis says, I believe the text means this and I want to avoid it, whereas exegesis says, I want to dig into this because God clearly included this in his word for some reason. And if God's word stands forever, there must be something we should take away from this. Okay, even though it's awkward, even though it's a little difficult. So 
we're going to go into that. And so here we are talking about the uncomfortable stuff. That's what we're going to do today. Um, John Calvin, a champion of the Reformation, once said, wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, and I might add in its entirety, including passages like this, there a church of God exists, even if it swarms with many faults. So we are imperfect. We are broken people saved by grace. So let's engage God's word fully this morning in an effort to better understand the one who saves. That's what we're doing. So would you all stand with me as we read today's passage? Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. This is the word of the Lord. Have a seat. So I'm going to reread this because I think this is a little too tame. Um, I'm going to read this replacing the word bond servants with slaves because there is a difference here. A bond servant and a servant, right? We can think of these, there were paid servants and then there were servants who were literally bound to the household. They were slaves. So I'm going to reread this and just hear the context. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a, good, with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or he is free. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. So let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, since understanding our salvation stands in our knowledge of your holy word, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that our hearts may be freed from the, cl the chains of sin, and so that we may hear and receive your word, recognizing your gracious will for us. Teach us by your scripture to love and serve you with delight, praising and glorifying you in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I want to address the elephant in the room. I kind of did already, but why, why is slavery one of those things we're so uncomfortable to talk about within Scripture? Right? On the one hand, and this is, this is kind of this uh, apologetic moment for us, our ability to, as, as it says in 1 Peter, always be prepared to make a defense for the faith you have, doing so with gentleness and respect, but be prepared to make a defense. You're going to have non-believers, you're going to have atheists, you're going to have combatants of Christianity pointing out texts like this to you and saying the Bible condones slavery. Slavery, look at that. The Bible is not condemning slavery. Slavery is not considered a bad thing in scripture. And they're going to point these verses out to you. And we need to be rightfully able to respond. Because technically, in their argument, they're not wrong. Right? In the Bible, it doesn't ever say slavery is bad. Don't do slavery. This is a bad thing. It just doesn't, it doesn't say it. You can't find that. You could pour through all 66 books of, Bible, of the Bible and you will not find a law that says don't be a slave owner, don't own slaves. It's reality, right? At the same time, you have Christians who are going to create biblical arguments around this and maybe say things like, oh, well, the way that slavery exists, it was really more of servanthood. It was really like, oh, well, they were really more servants in the house. That's not true throughout the entire course of scripture. Maybe in some contexts, yes but not always. You can't use a blanket argument of one point in time to create an understanding of the entirety of 6,000 years of scripture. It just doesn't work. So we have to kind of take a step back and understand that the Bible does not approve nor disapprove of slavery because slavery, and here's the key, slavery in and of itself was a worldly cultural construct. 
It was economic. It was social. It was created by the powers that be, the government powers, the, the leading powers who created the societies, right? And there were tons of cultures, not just, not just in the people of God, but cultures throughout the world that practiced slavery in different forms. So when the Bible discusses slavery, regardless of the nature of it, whether it says, God, oh, it's good, it's bad, this is how you treat slavery, things like that, the Bible is not purely meant to be a, 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 a rule book, right? Regardless of the nature, it provides a moral framework in which God is essentially saying, okay, look, I, I know you all have this thing called slavery that you've created. Let's talk about the fact that you're all people, you're all created in the image of God, and therefore we need to set some things straight about the status that you're assigning to slaves, right? If you're going to have this thing, let's talk about it. Let's not shy away from the topic, just like we're not supposed to shy away from the topic. Now, our view, as I mentioned before, our view of slavery is this one influenced by the dark realities of American slavery. I mean, it was evil. Let's call it what it was. Um, Again, that eisegetical understanding. There's these major emphasis, especially in like, oh, we got a presidential race coming up. There's going to be a lot of talk about racism and DEI and all these, all these topics. So we hear that so much that we just don't even want to talk about it. I want to stay away from those subjects whatsoever, and that includes slavery. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. But again, the slavery in the Bible spanned the course of millennia, thousands of years. And it's passages like this one from Ephesians 6 show us that the Bible is not purely a rule book about creation. It does have moral codes. It does discuss right and wrong. But the Bible, and this is the, 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 the realities of the Bible as a whole, not just concluding slavery, the Bible juxtaposes the realities of the kingdom of heaven with the brokenness of the world. It has to paint a picture of the differences between the two. It needs you to understand God has a heavenly reality. He says, this is what creation is supposed to function like. Here's the brokenness of the world. Let's not ignore the brokenness of the world, but consistently point people to the heavenly, the beautiful, the eternal. That's what God's doing. Um, so God uses his word to point out the brokenness of, of human-generated culture and directs us on how to approach it with a heavenly lens. That's what we're doing here. So slavery was a cultural reality, and we don't practice it today, thank God. So it can be uncomfortable to draw conclusions from passages like this, but there has to be something crucial that we can learn. So before diving in, I'm gonna, I want to break down the verses. I want to talk about the text today. But before diving in, let's just paint a, a slight picture of understanding of the slavery Paul's addressing in Ephesians. Because again, there's all different types as the... There's the servants, and there's the indentured servitude. There's all these different things, that you, depending on the time and place. This is Roman Empire slavery. It was not pretty. It was not good. Let's call it what it was. Roman slavery was harsh. According to the British Museum of History, slaves within the empire were not seen as human. They were property. That's it. No humanity was seen whatsoever. They were property to the slave owner. They could be bought they could be sold, they could be treated however they want by the slave owner, cared for or mistreated. They were unable to own their own property. They couldn't enter into contracts. They couldn't even get married. How could a non-human get married? It doesn't make sense, right? This is how they were treated. There were no specific racial ties to slavery either. Slaves were typically people who were either, um, they were either foreigners, they were prisoners of war, they were sailors captured by pirates and then sold. Just anyone and, any, and anyone vulnerable was taken as a slave and said, <laughs> here you go, live your new life or lack of life. It was, it was evil. Let's call it what it was. And I could keep going deeper, but the fact is Roman slavery devalued the image of God that existed within enslaved individuals by refusing to acknowledge that a slave was a human. So, to look at a slave in Roman culture was to completely ignore the imago dei, the image of God that rested within that individual. Almost like a, you're putting on these horse blinders and saying, no, I have to ignore that reality. Again, it's Roman culture. Most of them didn't even have that understanding of the image of God to begin with. They were creating gods in their own image for everything, right? That was Roman culture. So then we can compare that to the Mosaic law. And, and I know, Mike, you talked about this last week with 
with fathers and, or, or parents and children, that we, if we tie it back to the Mosaic law, um, I want to be very clear, the Bible does differentiate in the Old Testament between slaves of Hebrew descent and slaves of um, pagan descent. They were treated very differently. And the way that you, that, that you had to treat your slave, not that you treated a pagan slave poorly, but rather a Hebrew slave would automatically have their freedom in the year of Jubilee. Um, they couldn't be sold. They couldn't be bought. Like there were things that were bad. But I want to point us to Exodus 21, verse 16. It's not going to be on the screen, but I'm just going to read it. Um, because this has no nationality mentioned. This has nothing to do with pagans or Hebrew Israelites, nothing like that. Um, it just says, and this is, this is a good place to establish, whoever steals a man, again, no nationality mentioned at all, whoever steals a man. So if you kidnap someone and that person is sold and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Black and white, done. If you kidnap someone and sell them into slavery or you're the slave owner of someone who was kidnapped and sold into slavery, your punishment is death. That's it. That's not how people are supposed to be treated. That's not how we're supposed to enter into, into any sort of relationship. Kidnapping's bad, let's just say that. But um, God's law directly calls out one of the most evil practices of slavery across generations, to steal someone away from their life, to pull them from their place in society, and to force them into a life of slavery that the slave owner would financially benefit from. And God's word says that that is a great evil worthy of death. That is the punishment. So let's walk away with that understanding. But then this lies the key, and, and I feel like this is, this is the key to so many things, so many sins in scripture is selfish gain. What is the selfish gain from an act like this? In this case, financial benefit. Viewing people as property. People being used for our economic gain. Owning people as a pathway to financial success. These things go directly against the way of life in the kingdom of God. That's it. Um, in Acts 16, while journeying in Philippi, uh, it's actually one of my favorite stories uh, in Acts. Luke, uh, Luke is recording this, and it's one of the few times that Luke actually brings himself into the story. And they're walking, and all of a sudden there's this, this slave girl who starts following them and screaming at them. So um, in Acts 16, starting at verse 16, Paul, uh, Luke writes, as we were going to the place of prayer, so they were on their way to the synagogue, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So first of all, she had an evil spirit in her, but she was a slave being used for financial gain. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for days. So, even though what she's saying is true, she was being annoying, right? She was annoying Paul. And it literally says, she kept doing this for days. Um, Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Verse 19 says, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone. I love that phrase. They didn't care about the person. They just saw their hope of gain in this slave girl. They were making money off of her. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace before the rulers, and ultimately they were thrown in prison unjustly, and it creates this whole drama story, and it's fun, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. They were thrown in prison because they removed the financial value of a slave. That's what they did. Not because they, I mean, they, what they did was good. They cast a demon out of a girl. She no longer had that evil, vo evil spirit within her. She was free from that spirit of oppression, yet they were the ones thrown in prison because they removed the financial gain that the owners of the slave benefited from. Um, this, I think, really just defines the realities of slave culture in ancient Rome. It was all about financial gain, ease of life, financial benefit, economic status, all that kind of stuff. So calling Roman slavery again what it was, evil, and recognizing that traditionally Roman slaves were not seen as human. They were less than human. Um, let's return to Ephesians. So we're going to go back to Ephesians and starting at Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 5. So if we can bring that up. Um, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. 
So this is one of those out of context passages that it, an, a, an objector to the Christian faith would point out. They said, look at this. Paul is literally saying, slaves, you have to obey your masters. You just gotta do it. You gotta make it happen. Like, do, there's no option here. Obey your masters, fear them, tremble before them. If you were to read this at face value, it really doesn't sound great. Paul, what the heck are you saying? Um, and at first glance, it really, it, does it, is Paul saying, slaves, you're slaves. Just act like slaves. Obey your masters with fear and trembling. Don't question your role. That's what it sounds like. But I think we need to understand this phrase, fear and trembling, because it is used a lot in Scripture. And it's used as a positive phrase, not a negative one. Um, so starting in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, talking specifically about obeying him and God and the, the gospel and the word of God, as you have always obeyed, excuse me, um, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So equating pleasure with fear and trembling, salvation, working it out, fear and trembling. Salvation's a good thing. Pleasure is a good thing. Fear and trembling doesn't sound like a good thing, but it must be. It doesn't mean to live a constant, fee, in constant fear of, of losing our salvation. This isn't what Paul's talking about. Don't worry, don't, don't consistently fear that you're, you're saved now, but you won't be tomorrow. Like, oh man, I messed up, I'm not saved anymore. That's not what he's talking about. Recognize that your, your salvation is a gift from God and that he should be approached from a place of deep respect and humility. That's what it is. Fear and trembling is about recognizing that, wait, I'm going to respect God and I'm going to humble myself before God, understanding who he is and what he has done for me. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7.15, speaking of Titus's relationship to the church in Corinth, Paul says, and Titus's affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all and how you received him with fear and trembling. They respected him. They humbled themselves before him because he had something to offer them that, uh, well, the gospel, the good news of the gospel, and they respected it. Um, but perhaps Psalm 211 might give us the best understanding here. It says, serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. So in that, in that, um, uh, that humility and in that respect that we're to offer to God, that we're to offer to others around us, we're supposed to enter into that joyfully. If that fear and trembling was meant, when, when Paul says it to the slave, he says, if that, if that was meant to signify embracing a role out of mortal fear for your safety, there wouldn't be any rejoicing involved. That would, you wouldn't take that joyfully. When Paul calls for slaves to obey their earthly masters with fear and trembling, he means to approach them with respect and humility, not spite, not malice, um, or as we'll see in the next verse, not out of a desire to elevate their own position or doing right, just to be seen as doing right. Um, effectively, do not allow your place in life to negatively impact your Christian witness. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. He goes on in verses six and seven saying, not by the way of, so approach your masters with fear and trembling, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as slaves or bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, and not to man. So the recognition here is that the Christian, um, as, as a Christian, your true allegiance is to who? God, to Jesus. Not your master, not your boss, not a politician, not even your pastor. Sorry, Mike. Jesus alone is who your allegiance is to. Every other person will fail you. Every other person will treat you terribly at some point or another, even if they don't mean to. Jesus will not. When you were saved, your condition in life changed from a purely earthly one to a heavenly one. You were moving towards death, and now you are moving towards eternity. That's what it means to be in Christ. 
The call to the slave was to treat their master with respect, not for selfish gain, but knowing that in all things we are a witness to God and our good works are to the glory of God, not ourselves, not to please others. And, Paul, and, and ultimately, it is the recognition that even though my lot in life is terrible now, I have been saved and I have an eternity that is far greater. So it's ultimately, and what Paul is trying to do here is not say, look, you just got to, you're in this terrible spot, just, just do it. This is your spot. Like, you have to behave this way because you're a slave. He recognizes the challenge. He recognizes the pain that they probably go through on a regular basis as slaves of the Roman Empire, being ripped away from their lives, being forced into a life of slavery and being seen as less than every other person in the world. It's not a good place to be in. That's not a place you want to live your life. So he brings them some encouragement at the end in verse 8, saying, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or he is free. And I would say the opposite is probably true as well. Whatever bad anyone does, probably receive that too. So, I mean, not in a karma kind of way, but in a, if you're not a follower of Jesus, well, things aren't going to be so great for you. Um, Paul, again, is not saying to the slave, blindly obey your master because you're a slave. Here's the reality. He says, look, I know where you are in life. Now, you could argue, and the way I kind of look at it is Paul gave up a life that was fairly luxurious as a high-ranking Pharisee. And you could look at that and say, well, Paul willingly gave that up to live the life he lives. But I would say no. When Jesus knocks you off a horse and blinds you and says, you're following me now, I don't think, that, I don't think Jesus was giving him an option. It's the way it is now, Paul. So Paul lost his status in life. Paul lost his, his high seat at the table, his well-known status amongst the Jewish Pharisees, and now he was being hunted, actively sought after, stoned, threatened, and ultimately he was killed for his faith. So Paul is trying to offer a compassionate hand to the slaves saying, look, I know what it's like to be ripped from the life you once had. I know what it's like to be a follower of Christ. Or, sorry, I know what it's like to live a life that is difficult, but I also know what it is like to be a follower of Christ. And to be a follower of Christ is far greater than anything else this world can offer you. He writes it in Philippians 3, what, in, in verses 7 through 11, Whatever gain I had, speaking of his prior life, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. He's saying that former life I was ripped from, trash. I mean, he actually uses a more crude word, but trash. Let's just say trash. Um, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that, I, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. And just a quick contextual piece here. I've quoted Philippians like three times now. Paul was in prison when he wrote that letter. It's not like he was just sitting on a beach somewhere saying, I'm going to write this happy letter. His most joyful letter came from one of his darkest moments. So just keep that in mind. Paul did not have this luxurious life being able to freely walk around the Roman Empire without any resistance whatsoever. Now, he was a Roman citizen. He was able to travel, but often it was on kind of the backs of Judaism, and then he would get to a place and not talk about Judaism. But Paul knew what it was like to live a life that from an earthly perspective was deeply difficult. Who would want that life? Who would want to do that? So when he, when he, uh, he encourages slaves to do good for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the glory of of God and to please him alone because their salvation has already been won in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't think I said this, so I probably need to go back because this is from three weeks ago that you first mentioned this. This is within the, the context of the Christian household or if you are a Christ follower because I have to imagine there were probably some slaves who did come to know Christ and maybe their masters didn't know Jesus, but Paul was saying, hey, look, live this way. Be encouraged that 
even though this is terrible right now, there's something far greater awaiting you in glory. Right, so here's, the, here's kind of the redeeming part for me. Paul then turns his attention on the master, the slave owner. He says, no, no, you're not, you're not getting away that easy. Right? We're not going to give all these instructions to the slave and then ignore the fact that you exist, Mr. and Mrs. Slave Owner. Um, so picking up in verse 9. Okay, so masters, and I'm going to insert something here, everything I just told the slaves to do, do the same to them. And stop your threatening, that's a big one, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. God shows no partiality. And also, hey, you might be a slave owner, a slave master economically in this worldly culture of, ancient, of Rome. It wasn't ancient Rome at the time. Rome. But uh, guess what? When you die and go to heaven, that's not going to matter. Because guess what? You're all slaves to Christ. But that's an amazing place to be in. Um, one thing I do want to, and I think it's really important to, to bring up, um, in the 1800s, there was, I told Carl about this last week, and you can find a copy of it. It's in print. It's called the Slave Bible. And there was a Bible that was in circulation that slave owners in American slavery would give to their slaves and say, hey, learn about Jesus, read the Bible, removed everything, including this type of verse that made slavery sound at all negative. The slave owners absolutely disregarded Ephesians 6, 9 by saying, we're going to take it out of the Bible altogether. I don't want to be held responsible. You're still going to be held responsible. You're just ignoring the fact that you're going to be held responsible. So people are evil. I mean, that's just the reality. All, even our righteous deeds are filthy rags before the Lord. So people are going to do things, even claim their status as a Christian, and then still go out of their way to do evil. It's going to happen. Right, so removing, they were removing all this. And like I said before, Paul was living the good life as a Pharisee. But he counted all of that as loss and considered the persecution and the death threats worth it when compared to the realities of following Christ. But the slave owners in ancient Rome, most of them were still living the high life. If you were a slave owner, you probably had some level of wealth. If you had the ability to purchase a human, even though you didn't consider them human, um, Paul leaves no room for interpretation here. He says to the masters to treat their slaves with dignity, with respect, with compassion, and with love. Don't threaten them. Treat them like what they are, a human being. I mean, this is radical in Roman slavery. Radical saying this person who lives in your household is a person who lives in your household. They are part of your household. They are part of your family. They are a human being who lives under your roof. Even if the slave was not a believer, they were still in the household of the Christian, and therefore they were part of the covenant household. That's what Paul is calling the slave owners to. Within the covenant household of God, regardless of a person's eternal standing, the way they're treated should be consistent with the promises of God. And I think it goes without question that this simple concept, where Paul is literally saying to masters, hey, stop threatening them and treat them like a human being, totally upends Roman slavery altogether. So there's a lot of connections, and I, I, mean, I want to be respectful of time. There's a lot of connections that need to be made. I think I passed them over to Loretta. I said, hey, print these in the bulletin. I'm not even going to talk about some of these because it's just, it's a lot, and I don't want our brains to be ping-ponging back and forth. Um, but two things. If you have pen and paper and you want to write this down, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 20 through 22, really good, and a parable Christ tells in Luke 17, 7 through 10. And those are both in the bulletin, so you can always go back and reference those. Um, but in essence, we do not serve no, nor work for the sake of recognition, but purely because we know that God, our heavenly master, is pleased with our work. Regardless of, if we are, um, regardless of our status in life, our work is meant to glorify God, to take joy in God. All of it. So here's really where I want to wrap up today. Um, slaves and masters in Christ, 
though retaining that earthly role, like Paul's not saying, those roles are shattered, still retaining that earthly role, are called to a familial relationship. I mean, why would he include them in the same kind of thought of husbands and wives and children and parents and then slaves and masters if he didn't intend for those to be considered part of a family relationship within the covenant household of God? Not this, again, what slaves were considered at the time property. He's, he, didn't, he didn't shift from um, family relationships to property rights in one complete thought. He's saying, no, this is the covenant household of God. We're going to explain what that's supposed to function like. Um, over the past three weeks, we've learned about the role of husband, wife, parent, child. Now we've talked about slave and master. And we learned how Paul called the household to function. And I want to wrap up with some key takeaways here. And to do that, I, and I don't have the verse here, so if you do have your Bible, open up to Ephesians 5, verse 21, because that's where Paul starts this whole exhortation, I don't know what to call this, this whole kind of thing about the household of God, right? Verse 21 of Ephesians 5, after kind of talking about the Christian church in general, the church, the body of Christ, he turns and says, submit to one another, to the Christian, to all Christians, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's how he starts this entire piece on the Christian household. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not a single role that he goes over after this is about control. It's not about power. It's not about control. Every single one of these roles in the covenant household carries with it a form of heavenly submission with the express purpose of bettering one another for the kingdom of God. We function in our roles in the household to better one another for the kingdom of God. So he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands should be willing to sacrifice everything for their wives, to love them as Christ loved the church, yes, even willing to, being willing to give their lives up for their wives. Children should obey their parents. Parents should not provoke their children. And I, and I love the way he does this, because he always starts with the, the lesser seen in culture. He says, wives, submit to your husband. Okay, but wait, husbands your role is also very difficult. Children, obey your parents. That's a given. Parents, don't make your children angry. Slaves, respect your masters. Okay, well, that's kind of given in Roman culture. Uh, but masters, restore the humanity of your slaves that culture has stolen from them. That's a big ask. But he's saying that is what it means to be in the covenant household of God. You see, there are people out there who would say, if Jesus was alive today, he'd be a socialist. I mean, I think you brought this up last week. He'd be a socialist. He was all about equality. No, that, that's not it at all. When you read about the covenant household, it's not about equality. The household doesn't reflect equality, and to walk away with that understanding is to miss the point entirely. Now, it doesn't mean Jesus would be a capitalist either. We're not talking about economic systems. We need to stop tying those into our understanding of the Bible because those are always built on what you get. What did we talk about for economic, before economic gain? Economic systems are always about how we get things, how we make money, and then how we spend that money, whether it's given to us or we have to earn it. We then just want to spend it on stuff, like a PlayStation 5, right? I mean, that's pretty much what I'll spend it on. But <laughs> because they're always built on that, but, but here's the kingdom of heaven. To be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven isn't tallying up what it is you'll receive. Salvation was already won. When you follow Christ, you have already received the greatest gift you will ever receive, which is you who were dead are now alive. There are people who, want, you know, who, who spend their whole lives praying for healing, and we want that healing. We so desperately desire that. But if they have given their lives to Christ, it's like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if God does not bring that physical healing now, the greatest miracle, you who were once dead are now alive, has been afforded to you already. So stop focusing on what you're going to get because salvation has been won. The focus of the Christian household, the covenant household, is not on everyone receiving their allotment. It's not about receiving an equal share but it's about giving freely 
giving willingly of all things, everything. It's not about receiving equally, but giving everything without hesitation. That's what it means to follow Christ. The Christian household should reflect that reality. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you for your word, even when it can be a little hard to digest sometimes, even when it can be confusing when we first glance at it because it is speaking about something that makes us uncomfortable at first thought. So God, we thank you that all of your word is helpful, that all of your word teaches us and educates us both about how to live our lives as Christians, but also, God, about who you are, your goodness, your glory, how it compares what society can be like against the backdrop of your heavenly kingdom and how your way of life is just so much better, God. How it restores the soul, it restores the person, it restores the image of God. So God, I, I pray that you would help us to do that, to, to see the image of God in our fellow man, especially within our households, God, to, to live in such a way that every single one of us is working cohesively to better the others for the kingdom of heaven, God, to be better witnesses, to be better at sharing your word, to share your gospel, and to be a light in the lives of others that we interact with. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your goodness, and we lift this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.